Hi, everybody. My name is James Courier, and I'm an old friend of Dave's. And uh, he asked me to come here today and uh, kick us off. And my talk is going to be uh, broader, probably, than uh, most of the other talks will be today. And I think that that's intentional, trying to give us a foundation so that we can use similar language and think about how we operate toward growth in our companies. So um, uh, in order for you to understand where I'm coming from, I should probably tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I'm hitting the button. Is anything happening? Or did I hit the wrong button? How are we doing back there on the AV? What's happening? Guys, anybody? Who's in charge? Okay, so let me just tell you a little bit about myself. So um, I was a former venture capitalist in the 90s and then decided in order to learn more about building these big companies, I should become an entrepreneur. What we didn't know is that I'm a much better product person than I am a financier or anything like that. So I sort of stumbled into this, this role back in 1999 when I did my first A-B test. And um, oh, we've got a new clicker. Shall I try that one? And, okay, so what we're doing now is uh, I'm running a group called Ooga Labs. Ooga Labs is uh, an investment and advisory shop for marketplaces and networks, anything with network effects in them, right? 68, 75% of all the value created in Silicon Valley over the last 15 years are from companies with network effects in them. You've got to get to them. And to get to them, you've got to grow fast. So applying great growth techniques to those types of businesses, and many of you are running businesses that should have network effects already, and, and they will if you design them properly. Uh, that's what we're focused on. <clears throat> we spend all of our time doing that. Stan Chudnovsky is the head of growth at PayPal currently <clears throat> because we sold our third company to them last year, um, and, uh, and I was just in Switzerland for 14 months. So now I'm back. We started a company called Tickle back in 99. It was one of the first user-generated uh, content sites. Grew it to 200 million people, mostly virally. Uh, we then started a gaming company called Wonderhill, which we merged with Kabam. Uh, we, we sold Tickle for $110 million to Monster, and then with uh, Wonderhill, we merged it with Kabam, and we're about half their revenue um, within about six or eight months. And then with Iron Pearl, that was a SaaS product that allowed companies like Branch Out and Goodreads and Path to instrument their viral growth. And uh, we sold that to PayPal. And then we've started a, a SaaS product in the healthcare space, of all things. We just keep jumping from places to play. We're advising 31 marketplaces and networks right now. And <clears throat> when we talk to them, what they mostly ask us for is, what are the tactics that I, can, that I could use to grow to 10 million users today? And unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. <clears throat> we are going to talk today, or the whole day will be a lot about tactics. But the tactics exist in a sea of other things you don't always see. It's, it's a philosophy. It's a mindset that you have to bring to this to be successful. And if you bring the mindset, the tactics evolve out of the mindsets. Because the tactics are always changing. A tactic that worked three months ago isn't going to work three months from now. Right? Something on Facebook isn't going to work anymore because they've changed how, how the viral distribution works. So the tactics are constantly being reinvented in the context of your mindset. And don't worry that there aren't enough tactics or that there aren't enough ways for you to grow. It's our firm belief that there's at least 10 times the opportunities to grow that are out there that have been exploited by the companies you admire already. Okay. There's just so much opportunity to grow. It's just a matter of designing it properly for yourselves. Okay? There's, no, there's no scarcity of this. Right? Back when we grew Tickle to, to 200 million people, I think there were 800 million people on the internet. Right? There's now 2.4 billion. Okay? There's no scarcity here. So just keep at it in a measured way. But it's the mindsets that get you there. So let me talk about this story where you, know, you go up to two fish who are swimming in the water and you say, how's the water? And the fish look at each other and they say, What's water? They don't even see the water around them. And these mindsets that you bring to your growth hacking, to your, to your growth, to your company, to your product design, those are the mindsets that you're swimming in and you may not even notice them. It's your psychology. 
and it's the language you use to describe things. So when we go into these 31 companies and we you know, meet with them once a week, once a month, we go into their offices and we sit down and we work with them on their problems, we're repeating ourselves a lot. Right? For this company, it's the same problem as that company, the same problem as that company. Um, we created a one-day conference called NFX to address, address this around network effects. So what I want to talk to you today about are the five mindsets that I spend most of my time working on with these companies. Okay. Mindset one is to focus on the, on, the, on the psychology of the user. And this is very difficult to do because we have our own psychology. We have our own product. We have the, our own things that we're thinking about. And it's very hard to think about how the user is thinking. Okay? But we believe that behind every interesting big consumer internet company, there, are, there, there is an interesting insight about human psychology. So for instance, with Facebook, the insight there, I believe, is that people want to show themselves performing. And bear with me, they're showing themselves performing in order to get love. I mean, that's fundamentally what the pack animal homo sapien wants. Because that gives you your food, that gives you your safety. If you are loved by the pack, you're good. That's how we're wired. So Facebook has tapped into this in a, in a beautiful interface and perfect technology. Snapchat, the opposite. I'm sick of performing. I want it to be quick. I don't want to have to feel like I'm constantly performing. Tickle, the company we started in 99. Tell me about me. What's people's favorite subject? Is it their car? No. Is it their husband? No. It's themselves. That's all of our favorite topics. The most beautiful word in the English language is our name. Okay? That insight is what drove Tickle to get that big. Dragons of Atlantis, the game we built uh, at Wonder Hill, it turns out that we are also wired to build and conquest. So if you look at almost all the big games, people are building and conquesting, building and conquesting. And until we figured that out, and until you, if you look at history and you look at what made the Egyptian empire go, if you look at what Putin is doing today in Russia, it's building and conquesting. This is, we're wired to do that. And so once you build games that really hone in on those human motivations, that, that psychology of the user, you start to see really uh, big companies. Etsy is another one. The insight there is I'm unique. I want to feel unique. Etsy lets me feel unique. That's why people love Etsy. That's why they're so passionate about it. You could go down through 100 of these, but any of the 100 most interesting consumer internet companies, there's an insight there, I guarantee you. Okay, so you've got to ask yourself, what is your thing to them? What is it to, you know, and, and you look at your product all day long, and you're like, oh, this feature is different than that feature. That, but no, the user is thinking, I've got my, my apartment, I've got my car, I've got my job, I've got my kids, I've got my sick mother, I've got, and I've got my smartphone. Okay, now I've got a bunch of apps on my smartphone. Oh, there, there you are. That's what you look like to them. So think about their psychology. They, they're, you're this tiny sliver in their world. What is it to them so that you stand out to them? Okay? And that's communicated to them in language. So for instance, if you ask one of your users, what do you tell your friend this is? Listen very carefully to what they say. Because that language is how you know what you're bringing to them. At Tickle, for instance, I wanted to be a social media company. And I kept saying, oh, we're a media company, we're a media company. But everyone kept saying, you're a testing company. You're a testing company. I was like, fuck. No, I don't want to be a testing company. I want to be bigger than that. But in the end, we were a testing company. Okay. Notice the language. What is it to the user? You've got to be looking at that and be constantly evaluating that until you nail it. I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. We had a product that we built um, after we did testing and matchmaking and social networking. We then did a, a site for storing your photos because everyone was having trouble storing their photos back in 2004. And the growth was anemic. So on the home page, we changed it to say, share your photos, and then we put in a feed. We changed the one feature. I think it took us a day and a half to make this change. And the traffic exploded. We registered 53 million people in six months. Okay? We changed from store your photos to share your photos. And then based on the language change, based on what is this thing to me, the, consumer, the, the user gets there and they say, what is this thing to me? Oh, it's a place to share my photos. Okay, well, in order to share my photos, I've got to put one in and then I share. Oh, I've done it. I've done what the thing is. So changing that language then makes a lot of difference in your potential to grow. Or we had a, at a matchmaking site and its growth was anemic. And so we said, well, we can't afford to buy a lot of traffic. We have to get this thing viral. 
So we said, let's make it so that they can send out an invitation to all their friends, not just their single friends. And we changed the purpose of the site to help people find a date. So can I invite a friend of mine, hey, I'm on this single site, why don't you join it? No, you're not gonna do that. But if there's a site where I'm helping other people find a date, that's something that I'm, wor I'm, I'm, willing to, I'm willing to do. I'm willing to invite another person to that. And we grew to 29 million people in about eight months using that tactic. So that change of language, that, that actually took a long time to change the website over to do that. But the point is that by changing the language, you then change what it is to the user and their propensity to then virally spread increases dramatically. And almost more importantly, almost more importantly, is once you've changed the language, how you think about the product changes and your features and how you approach things changes. And your team will. So you and your team wake up and you're a find a date site, find a date site, find a date site. Then you change the word on the homepage. They, they wake up and they look at the site and it says help people find a date. And then they realize, man, this website is not fulfilling on those words. And then while they're sleeping, while they're eating, they're thinking, how can I make this product fulfill on those words? Okay. So it changes your thinking to change the language. Watch your language. And your product, your language has got to have emotional hooks. For instance, um, just recently, somebody I was working with had a, had a piece of language that said, signing in with Facebook will make our app work better for you. All right, that's a good reason it works, makes it work better, but no one was doing it. So then we looked at uh, WhatsApp, and WhatsApp has this great line. It says, feeling lazy, sign in with Facebook. Now you're talking to me about me. And you're telling me that the only reason I would sign in with Facebook is well, because I'm lazy. And yeah, I'm lazy. And yeah, it's easy. And I've got Facebook. Yeah, boom. And it dramatically increased the throughput on that, on that page by changing the language, the emotional hooks, talking with the user about their psychology, not talking to the user about your app and how your app will work better. Do you understand the switch there? That's the important switch. Another example would be create a profile, which is, what you think while you're building, you're, you know, you spent five weeks building the profile system and you want the user to create a profile on your profile system because that was a language you were using to build the system. But they don't really like doing that. Uh, what they like doing is something like start the action. Ooh, I want to start the action. That's what's going to happen to me. I'm going to start action, right? As opposed to I'm going to do something with your product. It's something that's going to happen to me. So switching from one to the other. You know, and, and in all of these things, it's not only emotional hooks, but it's also sort of triggers uh, motivational hooks. You know, there's a, a short set of, of motivations around uh, that, that people really respond to, whether it's social proof or um, uh, saving money or whatever. There's a very short list, and you've got to run through those things and think, what are they going to respond to in this situation better than something else? Not, not, what, not what can I talk to them about about my product? Okay. Second mindset, so that's the first mindset. Get your mind in the mind of the user first. Put them first, not you. Mindset two, and I work with people on this all the time and I have to remind them of all so because it's hard, it's hard. Uh, mindset two, the language comes first and then the features come second. Most people, we're all builders, right? We're building this stuff, we're coding this stuff, we're drawing it out on the whiteboard before we do it. We're builders, that's why we love doing what we do. But what ends up happening from that place we, we, we live in is that I'll build it and then I'll figure out what the language is that goes on top of that. This thing functions this way, it's gonna take me 12 weeks to code it, and, and then I'll put the language on it. And don't, don't do that, don't do that. Or at least build it so that you can totally change the product anytime you want because your, your product is gonna follow the language. If you're, when we first launched our social network in 2002, we said, invite your friends. And then High Five came along, copied our website, and said, see who's in. And they had 30% higher virality on that page than we did because of that language. But they had to have a feature which actually showed which of your friends was in, which we didn't have. It took us five days to code it. But the point was their features followed their language, and their language was better. Okay, uh, Recommended versus popular. It could be the same exact feature from a technical perspective, but it's not from an emotional perspective. It's not from what the product has to fulfill on psychologically for the user. So if you're gonna use recommended, it makes a difference in how you then build the product versus if you use the word popular. Another one I work with uh, people all the time on is, is, is it find, is it buy, is it shop? Different things are underneath those buttons. 
Different things should greet me as the user underneath those different buttons. But a lot of people just think, oh, I can just change those words around, it doesn't matter. The functionality is still good. It's not true. Um, share versus invite, add, follow, all very different things, even though a lot of people think they're interchangeable. Here's another way in which language uh, needs to lead, and that is in um, naming a company. So when we initially started our company, it was called Emode, because it was about emotional expression. And it was a horrible name because I didn't know anything about naming. And when we changed the name to Tickle, our traffic went up 30% initially and it doubled the value of the company overnight. It was a huge mistake. I had been laboring for years under this horrible name of my company. And as soon as I got to a good name where people could spell it, they could remember it, it was evocative, things jumped. Everything we were doing just jumped up. And so I had a really good case study for how important the name of your product, the name of your company is. It's not to be overlooked. And I would say 98% of the people I talk to underestimate how important the name of their company is, the name of their product. I was an investor in InfoSeek back in 1994, the first search engine. And I had to watch with tears as Yahoo crushed them. And they crushed them, in, even though they had an inferior search product for three years, they crushed them because their name was so much better. The press wanted to talk about Yahoo. They loved writing about Yahoo. They never wanted to use InfoSeek because it was a boring name. Google comes along. Their name is fantastic. You heard the word Google, and you remembered it right away. You could spell it. You remembered it. It, it was emblazoned in your mind. It's a very special word. They really, really benefited from having that name. They did a lot of other great things, too, but that name really helped them. Uh, working with Poshmark. You know, they were gosh posh at the beginning. And po gosh posh is not that bad, but Poshmark gives you that edge when you're working on women's style that just is so much better. You can see that thing becoming a giant company as Poshmark. Gosh posh, you just don't see it, right? Concept.io to Swell, working with those guys. You know, we went through a lot of different things and Swell really stuck. And then, and then in May, 27, May 2007, I, I've got a blog post up that you can go back on the Google Labs blog and see. And I basically said, Twitter's the first with the application growing fast and they nailed the name which can be a brand and a verb. Investors get in if you can. And when I saw that name and the brilliance of that name, I realized the attraction people were going to have to it. Everyone wanted to talk about it. Very important. And then there's, there's companies like Yevo or Informatica uh, who I've been working with. And the names are just, they're just bad. They're, they're not going to help. They're, they're, they're not going to help. And so, so we're in the process of changing the names of those companies. And then there are, then there are false positives on names. So again, I'm just I'm driving you toward language first. Remember, that's the mindset I'm trying to get at, get to you that I spend so much time with people working on. Language first, okay? So you've got a, a company like Daily Booth, and that, this is a false positive, just like Chat Roulette was a false positive, which was they grow virally really well because everyone kind of gets what they are, but there's no business there. And so they end up crashing because it's just a Daily Booth. It's, you know, it's... It's not a tickle. A tickle helps you. They could have become other things if they were called tickle, but they were called daily booth. And so it just came and went. Form spring it came and went. So be aware that there are some false positives as well in terms of, in terms of language and naming. You know, like you could, you could, here's another false positive. Hey, we tested a bunch of banner ads to see the best click through rate, and this one won. Oh, what was on it? See naked people. Oh, that's a false positive, right? Don't use language that leads you into a trap where you won't have a business after that click or after that. Okay, mindset three. Everybody with me? Good. This one is very tough. This one is very tough. Growth is never done. And I think the totem of growth people in this room, and that my totem, and you can adopt it if you'd like yourself, is the shrew. Dinosaurs ruled the earth. These shrews were little tiny creatures underground, and they were, they were basically, you wouldn't even notice them if you were an alien coming down 85 million years ago. But their survival strategy and the reason they were able to, and, and the way they were different from the dinosaurs and the reptiles and all that, was that they just never stopped moving. Even when they were sleeping, they're kind of moving. And the way they raise their young and the way they're constantly eating and constantly, um, they never stop moving. So the thunder lizard dominated, right? And, and Mike Maples talks about how do you build a big thunder lizard company, right? You want to be a big dinosaur. Well, you don't want to be a big dinosaur necessarily because when something bad happens, You've got to have the strategy of constantly moving. Never stop, never stop. And the shrew had that, and they're the ones who survived. So the real thunder lizard is the descendant of the shrew, and we're it. 
right? And we were actually descended from a shrew, it turns out. And uh, sorry for those of you who don't believe that, but um, <laughs> uh, it does appear that our common mammalian ancestor was a shrew. And, and, and our strategy as humans has been to constantly be moving. We were until 10,000 years ago. And as a product person, you're, you have to be constantly moving. Another way of saying it is only the paranoid survive. I mean, there's lots of different ways of saying it, but this is how I look at the, at the mindset you have to bring every day and always. And what so often happens is when things start going well, everyone goes, ah, I'm done. I'm good, man. I'm going to be speaking at conferences. I'm going to be on TechCrunch. I'm, I'm going to get that Maserati. And they start thinking. And you can't do that because it ain't going to last. Whatever you figured out ain't going to last. You got to keep moving. OK. And uh, I don't want to belabor the point, but in, we, we grew to 32 million in revenue at Tickle. And we had reached a limit. And everyone in my company was like, look, at we're, we're, we just tripled this year. We're doing great. And I was looking at the metrics. And I was like, guys, it's not that great. We are in trouble. Look at what's happening. We, we are going to go through shit here. And, and everyone wanted to believe that it was going to be OK, and it just wasn't. And we went down from 32 million in revenue down to 24 over the next year. I mean, we were, we were imploding. And, uh, and during that time, we re had to rebuild all the products. It took us 18 months. And then by the end, we were, we were doing about 40 million with six and a half for profit. But, but it, it's, it's hard to, to constantly feel like you're a shrew underneath all these, all these dinosaurs. But you are. And, and if you keep that mindset, it helps you do better. <laughs> OK? Um, and then there's a mobile app company I'm working with now who discovered uh, the Facebook mobile, uh, the, the way of buying ads on Facebook mobile before Facebook had good tools for people to actually find out how to buy on Facebook mobile. And uh, for three to five months, they just bought like crazy, five cents a click. It was unbelievable. And they exploded, and they thought they were done. They thought they were done. And not only did their systems tip over and break because they had too much traffic, because they were growing too greedily, but, but then they didn't have. B, C, D, and E growth strategies lined up and in the works to start replacing the one that they should have known was going to stop working at a certain point. So you've got to have the A, B, C, D lined up in the pipeline. Most of them won't work, but keep going. Okay. Mindset four, love your data enough. You've got to be committed to measuring everything. And what we found is it takes about half the engineering effort to build the system so we can end so that we can actually capture all the data. Half of it for the product, half of it for the data collection and, and analysis. And I didn't like to think that before. And I might be exaggerating a little bit, but if you keep that rule of thumb, it'll help guide you toward what really needs to happen. And more importantly, not more importantly, equally importantly, you must be committed to communicating that data well once you've got it. Okay? So when I go into these companies and I'm working with them, I want to see everybody looking at triangle charts. This is the lifeblood of your company. This is your retention statistics. This is your retention growth. You know, today I think we're talking mostly about new user acquisition, but we always say that you know, ret uh, retained and monetized growth is more important. Okay? And these help you analyze your retention growth. Okay? When I, so when I walk around an office, I can tell whether people are looking at triangle charts or not. How great is your daily email, your daily stats email? Do you have a daily stats email? How great is it? Because it should be fucking great, as Dave McClure would say. It should be a core part of your culture. You sh everyone in the company should be really proud of your stats email or your stats board or whatever it is. When I go into an office, I love to see the stats up on screens hanging from the walls because that shows me that the CEO and everyone on down cared enough to come in on the weekend, buy two or three screens at Costco, come in and wire it up, get that damn thing attached to the wall, take all that effort over the weekend so that everyone is watching the stats all the time because they love their data enough. Guys, we worked so hard to get this data. And we're not putting it up on TV screens and showing it to ourselves? That's ridiculous. We should be doing that. And, there needs to, and, I, and, and what I want to see in these companies when I go in there is, is there transparent and shared prioritization? So a lot of times people are saying, well, I'm not really sure what the growth team is doing, or I'm not really sure what I should be doing. And that's because there isn't shared data about what our priorities are. 
so that everyone knows what's up next and why their pet project still hasn't gotten done yet. Because there's good reason why it hasn't gotten done, probably. And if there's not, you're going to get a chance to express it. So the, you know, sharing data around the priorities and projecting it on the wall and talking about it and loving your data is really important. So ask yourself, do you love your data enough? Mindset five, uh, building a culture of growth. And you get, as we said, you got to love your data. Another thing that you've got to tell yourself and you've got to teach all the people you work with when you go back to your offices is you've got to be able to, to take the losses. You've got to be able to sustain that failure daily because you're going to fail daily. It's the system, it's the mindset that can't fail. The tactics will fail. The trials, the experiments, the language will fail every now and again. But you've got to iterate relentlessly, and that's a part of your culture. And you've got to keep looking for the 1,000% improvement. You know, people I, I, I meet with, they're like, well, the company's doing pretty well. That's why we raised the money. That's why we raised the money from Greylock, so we must be doing well, right? <laughs> no. No, you're not. Look at your own numbers. Well, it went up 4% last month. Who the hell cares? You know, it should go up 1,000%. If you're not shooting for 1,000%, you certainly won't get 50%. Uh, and you must commit to the growth. And, you know, we've got to see the CEOs be on the growth team. And we've got to see the fact that people are willing to break eggs. You've got to have people with, their, with growth in their titles. Or at least the group should have a, a, a title. And then have a regular meeting so that there's, there's energy in the room. Uh, and there's an understanding that that's our responsibility to grow. And you've got to enjoy that data. You've got to love that data. And... And one more point that people often miss about the psychology you have to have is that the growth people have to be a little bit more aggressive than the CEO. You want the CEO pulling back on the reins a little bit. If the CEO is pushing you, then something's wrong. You're in the wrong job. If you're the growth person and the CEO is pushing you, you're in the wrong job. You need to get aggressive and have the CEO say, oh, no, no, that'll, that'll hurt our brand. Or no, 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 that, that goes a little too far. No, don't, don't use that word. That's, that's what you want to see in an organization. And you need to create that, either as the CEO or as the growth person working with the CEO. So those are the five mindsets. That's the C you're swimming in that nobody talks about. That's the C that you know, really, really matters. And once you get those mindsets down, now we're going to have a good shot at implementing the tactics. And, uh, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you.